I'm James Anderson. Welcome back to another episode of my podcast, Music is Just the Word. Remember this scene from Anchorman? Could you imagine if somebody spoke about music the way Ron Burgundy speaks about laughter? I don't really have to imagine someone talking about music the way Burgundy talks about laughing, because most days of my life, this is a reality. You really wreck moments when you do that, Ron. (laughs) Have you ever heard the expression, talking about music is like dancing about architecture? Or maybe you've heard, writing about music is like dancing about architecture. There are more variations still, and there are also many possible originators to these quotes, but they seem to convey a fairly straightforward sentiment. When it comes to language about music, something just isn't right. There might even be something absurd about making language about music. In any case, this podcast is an exploration of how talking about music and dancing about architecture are complete polar opposites, which is in their prevalence, their popularity. Language about music is everywhere. Language about music is probably as common as music itself, if not more common. How many people do you think have ever actually danced about architecture? Maybe like a hundred in history? Perhaps a thousand at the most? Now, how many people have ever talked about music? I would say it's probably almost all of us. And even if there are people that don't talk about music, they know just as well as everyone, music is the talk of the town. I think the hilarity of the Anchorman scene stems from the absurdity of having someone narrate laughter in real time. It can be pretty silly to jump into play-by-play commentary about things in general, but what makes it extra silly when that thing is laughter is that laughter is its own independent form of communication, not like a foreign language that we need to have translated in order for us to understand, but actually a universal form of communication that we all speak natively. Babies can communicate with laughter before they can communicate with language, and you might even be able to make the argument that laughter came before language in overall human prehistory. Laughter can communicate things that language can only approximate through translation, and often in a very clunky way. That scene from Anchorman is so absurd and so hilarious because we instinctively know that the universal, freestanding form of communication that is laughter is not being furthered or aided in any way by being subjected to the completely separate form of communication that is language. I almost can't imagine a person who doesn't understand the difference between expressing laughter and expressing words about laughter, and that's just what makes Anchorman such a funny movie. But for some reason, the distinction between musical expression and language about music is a bit more fuzzy. I wonder if this has something to do with the fact that music contains quite a lot of language in the form of lyrics. 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 All the different ways of communicating say things that only they can say. As much as language is able to name all these communications, it's not a proper substitute for them. It can't replace them. Making live play-by-play commentary about laughter is not the same thing as laughing. Just like the finger pointing at the moon is not the moon. Music, like laughter, is a universal form of communication, one that we all understand the way someone understands their native tongue. But unlike laughter, not everybody makes music. There's a sizable portion of people who participate in this unique form of communication more or less from the outside. These many people who consider themselves to be unworthy or unqualified to play music can still enjoy and comprehend the music and respond to the music in a variety of ways. So music appears to be kind of a universal language, but not quite to the same innate extent that laughter is. 
Whereas the musical communications themselves can often appear prohibitive and difficult, appearing to be restricted to a special qualified few, communications about the music in the form of language are available to be made by anyone. So what you get is a music culture where many people's main or only contribution to the music is to talk about it in one way or another. And everybody talks about music, musicians and non-musicians alike. Among musicians, who usually both play music and make language about it, it's often the talking that earns us the income. And it's certainly the talk, rather than the music itself, that we use to jockey for status. Most music professions require as much language as music, and many music professions are entirely language-based. Whether in the production, or the marketing, or distribution, or the education, or the equipment, or the politics of music, the people talking about the music seem to have the comfortable, prestigious positions. Not only are their buildings full of people whose job is basically to talk about music, or otherwise to process or influence the music, but these people seem to be the comfortably employed ones, with the benefits and the salaries, while the people that are making the music that all the talking is about are the token struggling artists, the grunts of the industry. Often these people end up as clients and customers, rather than earners of income. These are the people who have to duke it out in the trenches and deal with instability and uncertainty. You'd think that the actual musicians would be a special, high-ranking, revered class among these middle people. But think again. There are professions, enterprises, and entire industries devoted to making language about music, while the actual making of music is either a hobby or a gamble that is likely to not pay off. Among people calling themselves professional musicians, people whose actual job is to make the music, many of them can't stop talking about music for long enough to actually make it. In the last couple of episodes, I pointed out how much of modern-day musical gatherings and musical projects involve people's making indirect contributions to the music, sometimes contributions that appear to be very important, but contributions that are themselves not music, and that require others to be making the actual musical gestures. In this way, you can have gatherings that are apparently all about music, but when you look at the individual behaviors that people are making, there's almost nobody making music, because almost everybody is busy reacting to the music, or prompting the music, or announcing the music, or facilitating or coordinating the music, or otherwise influencing the music in some non-musical way. The people with all the influence in music, the people who seem to build communities around music, are these the actual people making the music themselves? Usually it seems not. It seems that the educators and the promoters and the producers and the advertisers and the funders the reviewers and the announcers and the business people and the administrators and the facilitators and all the other makers of these indirect non-musical contributions, they seem to be the ones that have enough influence over their fellow people that anyone should bother to follow in their footsteps. As mimeticist Susan Blackmore describes in her book, it's these types, the influential ones, that people are most likely to imitate. So it's the behaviors of these influential non-musicians that end up replicating. And this is how we can get to the point where music is sick and dying, as described by bassist Victor Wooten, even though by all appearances we have a society very much in support of music. Of course, a lot of these non-musical roles surrounding the music are very difficult and very creative, and there's a lot of good people filling them. People who do their best and work hard every day for the sake of music. And of course, I would never want to fault or blame someone like this. In the way of memetics, we can look past any ill intent on the part of people, and we can criticize music's culture and observe the way the culture has evolved into something that is dominated by non-musical communications, namely language. Everyone's experience is bound to be a bit different, but I think most people should agree with me that the market for talking about music and otherwise influencing music from a non-musical standpoint is threatening to outgrow the market for actually making music, if this hasn't happened already. Look at the sizes of people's operations for talking about music and otherwise mediating music. The giant record companies, the giant streaming services, the big promoters and advertisers, the big funding agencies, the big academic programs. Look at the size of the buildings that are dedicated to the talking about music. Now, look at the sizes of people's operations for actually making music. 
These operations are often very individual, very scattered, and under a lot of pressure just to find the space and time and just to get noticed. There seems to be incomparably more economic activity surrounding the language about music than surrounding the music itself. These days, being a musician or otherwise entertainer is much more dependent on the songs and dances surrounding the actual music, the management, the production, the planning, than anything to do with the actual singing and dancing themselves. The simple and tragic truth is that in today's music economy, you really can't go anywhere unless you have as many work hours dedicated to talking about music and otherwise representing it as are dedicated to the actual music. Everything about a music project is riding on what people say about it. Big deal musicians are big deals because of what people say about them. Struggling artists struggle because of what people do or don't say about them. Everything about the music is determined by some language or another, whether it's the reviews or the critical acclaim or a big booking or money being exchanged, money itself being a language of sorts. If I roll out a big music project this year, it's hard to see how the actual music could get anywhere near as much attention as all the talk and otherwise reactions. The talk might concern who's involved, what alliances exist between the people involved, and how do these affect alliances between players in other projects? Does anyone's involvement in the project jeopardize other alliances? Was anyone betrayed? What are the ethnicities of the people involved? What are the genders and sexual orientations of the people involved? What are the ethnicities, sexual orientations, and genders of the listeners? Or of the people involved in similar music projects? What are the backstories of the people involved? How much did the music cost? What was all the money that changed hands? What genre titles are applicable? What other music do these titles pertain to? What is represented by the music? What does the music mean? What are other people saying about the music? In my decade or so working as a musician, and many years before that as an amateur, I have watched music talk consistently spiral out of control, often overshadowing the music and taking precedence over the music in some way or another. I really haven't found too many ongoing musical scenarios that don't become about the words. In contrast to dancing about architecture, not only is music talk absurdly prevalent, but it is actually finding ways to become priority over the music itself. It's common to hear people refer to music as a language or a universal language. But if music is a language, why isn't it speaking on its own behalf the way English does or French or Dene or Spanish or German or Cree or Lithuanian or any of the spoken languages do? All these languages seem to stand on their own two feet. But music, language-like as it may be, doesn't seem to be able to stand on its own two feet. Music always seems to require, to depend on, these spoken languages and to constantly be influenced by them in some way or another. At least that's the way it seems in my mostly English experience. There are many contexts in our culture where somebody has artificially or intentionally required explanation to accompany music. Recitals, grant applications, and interviews are examples of this. These are apparently innocent situations where talking about the music is an explicit goal. What happens, though, is that these artificial contexts where music requires talk seem to bleed over into situations where the music doesn't require talk or shouldn't require talk, but people are talking about it nonetheless. Scenarios where we've accepted that music should require explanation and analysis seem to have a knack for spreading into contexts where the music ought not to require any explanation or analysis. And next thing you know, you can't get from the start to the end of the song without stopping and bickering, or without someone needing to explain something or give some instructions to somebody. Talking about music and dancing about architecture is actually a really funny comparison because if there was a performer who was dancing about architecture, how would you know that that's what they were doing? Their performance would certainly require some explanation. A performance that requires explanation is a performance that can only exist thanks to an intervening form of communication, like language. So it's not really an independent, freestanding communication. Similarly, music that requires explanation, introduction, analysis, and extensive arrangement in the form of notations or recordings isn't really succeeding at being a language of its own since it requires these adjacent forms of communication just to exist. 
To put it in slightly fancier terms, the music requires extrinsic contributions. For many musical scenarios, it's not enough just to have people contributing intrinsically to the music. The music often needs these extrinsic, non-musical contributions to tie it all together. Or does it? It seems pretty safe to say, in general, that there are some kinds of music that naturally require talk, as well as other non-musical contributions, and other kinds of music that don't. If you want to sound like Snarky Puppy or Toto, you probably need a lot of planning, preparation, some of which will probably include recording, and perhaps a fair bit of notation. If you want to sound like a symphony orchestra, you're going to need a lot of notated music. These examples I just mentioned, for the most part, have self-evident artistic value. By contrast, think of something modern and avant-garde that heavily relies on introduction, explanation, and theorizing, just so that people realize that it's art. For example, take John Cage's experimental composition, 4 minutes and 33 seconds, which involves any combination of musicians performing nothing. Complete silence. Basically crowdsourcing for any sounds that will end up as the performance. This seems like the musical equivalent of a canvas that is painted in one solid color, and you basically need either a little sign or a tour guide to tell you to look for the art in the subtleties of the brush strokes or something like that. So that's art that heavily relies on extrinsic contributions, language, explanation, and so on. And at the very opposite end of this spectrum, we can imagine art that is able to stand on its own two feet. In the particular context of music, this might mean a few different things. It might mean music that doesn't require much talk, music that is self-contained, music that can more or less be assembled on the spot using cues if necessary, or else standardized song forms. Probably the best example would be drum circles, but also a blues jam, a jazz jam, an old-timey or bluegrass circle, or maybe a powwow or a round dance. I have a friend who told me excitedly once about a funk jam she found at a place called Supermarket in Toronto, and apparently it was a funk jam in the same circular setting as a bluegrass or an old-timey jam, and apparently it lasted for hours and hours, players managing to sub in and out using some kind of honor system. And I'm very excited when I hear about things like this, because by the sounds of it, music is alive and well, and not requiring much as as far as non-musical involvement. However, musical situations where language gets involved as an add-on or extra or reinforcement can very quickly evolve into musical situations where language is involved as a requirement. How would you know if you were in the presence of talk-dependent music or talk-independent music? The different degrees to which music requires talk are influenced by nothing other than people's talking. The necessity of language to accompany music is like a virtual reality or a simulation, and we spin up this simulation ourselves in no other way than by talking. Having incessant verbal direction of music naturally perpetuates the idea that music can only exist if there's language directing it. If you talk enough about music, you can maintain the illusion that music can only exist with the constant support, direction, intervention, and evaluation of spoken language. If you're dedicated enough, you can keep a whole community under the assumption that if a song doesn't last uninterrupted from start to finish, it's because there wasn't enough discussion and planning. And of course, for some music, you do need the discussion and planning. But other music, and plenty of it, works just fine in a spontaneous and interactive way without the intervention of any kinds of communication other than music. This kind of freestanding music, you can never really stop. It's like plants pushing up between concrete. But it is possible to weaken this kind of music and spray pesticides on it by giving it zero recognition and by allowing it to be interrupted by the music that has been announced, planned, discussed, anticipated, and otherwise spoken about. Once people start understanding the music to be non-self-sustaining and non-self-directing, once people accept that the music requires the influence of non-musical behaviors, it's a slippery slope. Language behaviors replicate wherever they can. The natural adaptations of language behaviors converge with people's intentions to be influential and talkative, and as this progresses, the language gets more and more prevalent and influential until eventually it's not really about the music anymore, it's now about the words. 
In contrast to music, words are always about something. So if it's all about the words, it's effectively all about anything that the words are about. And next thing you know, you got a music culture where the music is starting to look an awful lot like a means rather than an end with intrinsic value. And that's M-E-A-N-S, a means towards an end. Taking a short break here from talking about memes, M-E-M-E-S. Meanwhile, things that would intuitively be the means towards the end that is the music start looking a lot more like the ends in and of themselves. People become so solely focused on making staged, scripted, branded music, recorded music, on making owned music, curricularized music, and all the other kinds of music shticks. These roles outside of music are what prosper in a society where music appears to depend on language. And the more popular language gets, the more there is an opening of the floodgates for people's peripheral, extrinsic involvement in the music. If peripheral influence to music becomes too popular, people may start neglecting to actually replicate the musical gestures. It gets to a point where you just have to ask, is it really about the music anymore? Or is it more about the staging and the scripting and the branding and the ownership themselves and so on? If the planning out in advance of a whole show and the branding involved in popularizing an act are all just tools to further the music, then I'm all in favor. But if this kind of behavior continues to the point where people are hard pressed or incapable of making music without these things, then it starts to look like there's some dependence here. What may have once seemed like a harmless addition or a representation becoming involved in music has now transformed into something that the music can apparently no longer exist without. If the creation of an elaborate produced stage show is the only thing motivating us to make music, then is it really still about the music? Or is it about creating an act? Of course, for many people, this isn't really a distinction. And I suspect for some people, music simply translates to creating a staged act. Of course, not everyone defines music the same way. After all, music is just a word. But it's things that most of us would agree are not part of the music that end up influencing the music the very most. We always have to ask, what are the means and what are the ends? Is the naming of music, the commentary, the explanation, the analysis, as well as the production and the politics and the academia of music, are these really actually tools to further the music? Or has the music become a means and these peripheral things become ends and priorities? We have a culture of music that is dominated by language, and it's been this way for as long as I've been on the scene. I started working as a musician in 2013. A group recruited me with perfect timing just as I was finishing up school. And this band relied on a lot of written notation, which was basically unavoidable given the arrangement of the group and given the kind of music we were making. And I definitely have fond memories from this group, but I also remember having business meetings to decide how often we were gonna have business meetings in the complete absence of any gigs being booked. I'm reminded of a conversation I saw on TV between Jerry Seinfeld and Bill Burr. I had a meeting one time. They wanted to have a pre-meeting to the meeting. Like, for what? Larry Miller says the show business is not about the shows. It's the shows are just there to justify the meetings. We don't care about the shows or the movies. That's secondary. It's who's in the meeting. It was a good meeting. It was a positive meeting. Yeah, I had a fantastic... We would often arrive at rehearsal and there would be little or no interest in making any music. It was simply more important and more pressing to discuss preparing a written code of conduct or to discuss whether or not one of the members should buy a USB stick or negotiating what different people's roles would be. We made a convention of gathering regularly, but then we would often end up reaching for ways to fill the time to justify the meeting. And usually at some point in the gathering, there was a suggestion that Oh, perhaps we should sing something. And this often came across somewhat as an afterthought. Soon after that first band, I got picked up by an instrumental combo and I was to be playing keyboards. We had some ambitions of maybe playing some jazzy music or some funky music or maybe some instrumental pop covers or something. And we couldn't get to the point where we were actually putting on shows. We kept having to go back to the drawing board and re-entering negotiations with our words to determine in advance what kind of music we would be making. No goals ever seemed to sound good enough to us in the world of words to propel us into real musical action. The whole thing we're excited about is never gonna happen. That's what show business is about. Everyone in that room left that room going, this feels good. 
<laughs> and that is the best we'll ever feel. Because if we do actually make this thing, everyone's going to have some issues with it. The numbers are soft. I didn't envision that. This isn't what I don't we think discussed. we were looking at it the same way from the beginning. But look, I've set up another meeting on a different project. We're going to go to that one. Pretty soon after this, I got picked up by a popular music band that was going to play Top 40's hits from the present era, with the associated music videos playing in the background on a big video screen. It was kind of a neat concept. I ended up making some connections in this group that would turn out to be very beneficial, and it was also my foray into synthesizers. So this group was my introduction to a particular style of band leadership involving an incessant coaching of other people's contributions, but a general lack of accountability for the leader's own musical contributions. This leader talked also fairly incessantly about the exciting future of the band, and I couldn't help but get sucked into the dream. This was one of the first of many, many projects claiming to be my big break that ended up fizzling out before it could really pick up very much momentum. Over the next few years, I would meet many versions of that same archetypal band leader powering themselves and their projects up by promising me the world and talking my ear off. So all the promises that never came true, and all the fizzle out projects and all the stillborn projects, all kind of left an impression that there's something inherently broken about music projects. But I have to remind myself, is it really the music that's responsible for a project not working out? Have all the failed projects, fallings out, and general dissatisfaction in music been because of people playing wrong notes? If the music never seems to live up to the talk, you could cast your suspicion towards the music, but instead I'm going to suggest we criticize the language for building up all these expectations in the first place. So something that came out of the Top 40's pop band was that two of the members persuaded me very urgently to go back to school and get my bachelor's degree. I don't think they really cared what I got it in, but they were just very convinced that I needed my degree. So I went for it. I enrolled in McEwen. I had already been there from 2011 to 2013 as a full-time student, and so now I was back for something of an afterlife in my music school career. So everything was different about my academic experience this time around. I was pretty much in school for the sole purpose of being able to say that I have a degree. I went through school and I got my bachelor's. So in this kind of crude, oversimplified account, the music is the clear means and the eventual language outcome is the clear end. But this was actually a pretty consistent theme the whole way through school. Music academia is first and foremost a place where you go to learn how to talk about music. Universities may have all kinds of stated goals and curricula along the lines of learning music, but through the unique and very talkative culture of music academia, institutions are really grooming students to be music educators and adjudicators. Through the hours and hours of talking and writing about music, a student implicitly learns that to achieve status in music is to be the one delivering the potent lines about music in the form of language. And the fact that all the language at Music Academia is about music doesn't change that the music is essentially the means and the language is essentially the end. As such, forms of music that are conducive to language are very common in school, such as lyric music, rehearsed music, marketable music. Music Academia is as much a school for scripting and monetizing music as it is for playing interactively. When I had to take the class known as Contemporary Combo, it was illuminating for me to see how naturally the classmates made English the default, the common and basic and preferred way of communicating with brief moments of music interspersed throughout the class time. Any music that we made was with the intent to mirror a pre-existing recording towards the eventual goal of grades. This is music that was made at the verbal request of someone with an articulated end goal of positive grades and feedback. A clear case of music as means and language as ends. Any music making we managed to do was grudging, stressful, and honestly just a foundation on which to make more talk. Grant McEwen is actually pretty renowned for being a hands-on music school. Supposedly there's a fair bit of playing compared to other music programs. So I imagine if I went to another university, it might have been even more language favoring at the expense of the music, and I might have had all these same complaints times two. The few people involved with music academia who are not going into debt because of it, in other words the staff, the teachers, are really in attendance because of what language they can offer, more than any musical offering. 
And of course, the teachers are the highest ranking people in the program. So who do you think the students are going to copy? Everybody wants to be like their role models. So they imitate the people who look the best and have the highest social standing. And because these people happen to be the ones talking about the music, it's the talk that ends up getting copied. Following in the teacher's example, students seek opportunities to show each other how good they are at talking about music. Identifying problems or potential problems with other people's musical ideas to demonstrate that they are knowledgeable and professional. Once in a while, a music school will bring in a special guest to put on a clinic. And in my experience, these clinics involve more language about music than music itself. Whether in clinics or in regular classes, question period is a chance for a student to show their skill when it comes to talking about music. When there's a special guest or clinician, students will line up to ask them questions basically pointing them in a direction and saying, speak on this topic, speak on that topic. You'll be a star among the teachers if you can make a meaningful piece of language emerge from a guest speaker's mouth. In the 10 years that it took me to complete my bachelor's, I had enough praise for asking good questions or entertaining questions that I think it actually made me ask some stupid questions later on. Really, I was just trying my hand at this whole music school game of talking about music and it often made me look or feel like a fool. Whether within school or outside of it, there have been times in my life where I come to the realization that my language about music is miles ahead of my music. And there have even been times when I realized that my language about music is so far ahead of the music that it's actually detracting from it. With such a culture of talking about music, there have been times when I've played along and went with the flow and ended up saying things that I would regret. Some of my relationships on the scene still feel strained even years and years after I've said certain things that I ended up regretting. Sometimes you can just tell that the whole point of music for someone is to have people say certain things about it. Do some of us only play music for what the music offers the language aspect of our lives? We have a culture of taking much more seriously these language aspects and otherwise peripheral and secondary effects of the music. And with some people, I sometimes have to wonder whether the reason they make music even has anything to do with music. Some people seem like they only play music so that they can announce that they've made music or so that they can post a video of themselves making the music. Some people seem to only make music so that they can get political about it or so that they can give instructions and order people around. Of course, everyone's reason for getting into music is probably a little different. Music being just a word, it's not impossible that someone's definition of music is making sounds and then talking about them. <laughs> we are laughing. <laughs> and we are very good friends. <laughs> good buddies sharing a special moment. <laughs> Don't say anything wrong, you know, just let it happen. <laughs> <laughs> laughing and enjoying our friendship. So I've been talking about intrinsic versus extrinsic or peripheral contributions to music. But if music is just a word, if music is a non-distinct realm that we can't really segment away from the rest of life, then there's nothing that's definitively non-music. There's nothing that's certainly extrinsic to music at all. We have kind of a cultural mythology that some human communications can fall cleanly and distinctly outside the jurisdiction of music. And I'm challenging this when I say things like, music is just a word. With the mythology that certain sounds can be decisively non-music, it would follow that we don't have to worry when all of these allegedly non-musical sounds surrounding the music are ugly and discordant and full of conflict and strife, as long as this distinct performative group of behaviors and sounds we classify as music end up sounding good and being a good product. The idea of music's separateness tells us that it's okay to argue, to be unkind, to talk people's ears off and to have fallings out with people, to have ruined relationships, and so on and so on, as long as we end up with a good piece of music. But I'm trying to make the point that it's all music and all the work and process and journeying that eventually leads up to your polished, marketable product is no less music. Including these other interactions in our definition of music might make us accountable for them being harmonious. Is music really such a distinct activity, so removed from our everyday life and our real relationships, that it's okay to mistreat people and ruin relationships as long as you end up with a polished, marketable stage performance? I say no. 
I say that, at its core, music is nothing more or less than our real relationships, and that where there is politics in music, these are real politics dealing with real issues, like influence and representation. The fact that we have an umbrella term like music to state that this is a distinct realm of some kind really doesn't count for much. If I'm in a music teaching position and somebody is treating someone else in a way they have no business doing, how can I critique their relationship on non-musical grounds if they've only hired me for musical counseling? If somebody ever requires my counsel or my opinion about a relationship, it shouldn't greatly matter whether or not my advice explicitly concerns music. After all, music is just a word. Oh, you said uh, it again. I knew it. I knew it. Right. Is that the right. right. you were going to say? Okay, okay. Well, take a song I promise I'll say it again. Until the end. Yeah. Until the end. Until the end. Until the end. Until the whether or not you buy into my idea of music being a non-distinct realm that possibly even includes language and the everyday interactions of our general lives, I want to make the very simple and kind of obvious observation that, at any given festival or otherwise musical gathering, there is much more music happening than the music that appears on the programs and the posters and on the website and otherwise in the media. Underneath the very top level of all the promoted, produced, scripted, staged, bought and sold music, there is a more pervasive, more constant, more casual layer of music happening in a more spontaneous and a more interactive way. And this would mainly include the jam sessions. But even underneath this layer of more or less casual jam sessions, there are still further levels of music even more casual and interactive than the jams. Think of parents singing lullabies to their kids, for example. And if you keep progressing down these levels, you eventually get to the musical sounds that two strangers will make while passing each other in the street to keep the mood lighthearted. <laughs> Of course, this far down the spectrum, and not everyone will consider this kind of stuff to be music, but the point is, music features a broad spectrum of involvement from other forms of communication, like language. There is music that heavily relies on language, and there is music that doesn't rely on language. Music that flows freely without involvement and intervention of language, and some music that isn't even reflected in language at all. Music that proceeds without even a name or comment whatsoever. And perhaps there is an argument to be made that the music at this very far end of the spectrum could possibly just be laughter. There is a lot that we can communicate to each other with laughter, but as far as the naming systems of language go, laughter mostly flies under the radar. Other than when people object to each other's laughter, and other than extreme cases and parodies like Ron Burgundy, people tend not to comment or critique very much on laughter. Laughter rises and falls through a day, and sometimes comes all at once in a mighty burst. But laughter is so much its own independent form of communication that we generally accept it as an alternative to language, sort of a language in its own right, rather than just another thing to be spoken about. I'd really like to think that, maybe not so long ago, we accepted music in a similar way. I have conveyed frustration and dissatisfaction with my music career. But through all these years of tension, strife, and expectations around projects and so on, the music that has always been there, coming to the rescue, is the music that hardly gets talked about. The impromptu, the unscripted, the real-life, social, musical communications that garner musical responses and aggregate into extended, informal jam sessions. This is often the music being made by half of the band while the other half of the band is outside smoking. This is also generally the kind of music that starts a project when musicians see how easy and natural it is to make amazing sounds with each other, but then the rest of the project involves trying to recapture those feelings and those sounds, and in trying to recapture them in an organized, language-mediated way, we just end up straying farther and farther away from these moments of pure creation. Over the past many years, while I haven't been able to get a project off the ground, there has been a bottomless well of social music, interactive music, unscripted music, music that just seems to happen, and then it's gone, and you can never get it back again. But that's okay, because there's infinitely more where it came from. This is the kind of music that pushes up like weeds between the cement that is the project approach. I'm ready to start giving an honest effort to this kind of music because this is the freestanding language that is music. And we really should be giving space to this music to speak for itself.
Thanks for tuning in to another episode of Music is Just a Word. I'm James Anderson. Hope you enjoyed the podcast, and I hope you tune in to part four. Music and opinions by me. And thanks to Q Mike McGee for screaming the title. I'm signing off for now, but we'll see you again soon.